Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk, we talk movies. And now, here's Popcorn Talk's Anatomy of a Movie. What's going on, moviegoers? It's another episode of Anatomy of a Movie. I'm Ryan Nelson, senior producer of Popcorn Talk, and today we are talking about Sonic the Hedgehog. It's the new video game movie based off the Sega character, Sega character, and I'm joined by an incredible co-host. Y'all, he's an editor. He's a DJ. He's the host of the NXT and Raw After Show, and he's a massive Sonic the Hedgehog fan. It is Flobo Boys. Yo, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm jamming out this theme music. This is great. I know, we got jams for this. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's yeah. popcorn talk, because yeah. you're usually on the more of the After Buzz content. Yeah, bro. After Buzz content. Try and get the Black Hollywood live, but until then, popcorn talk is where I'm at today. PTN, and <laughs> yeah. it's a great show to be on today because it's Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah. You know, most video game movies, let's be honest, they're not good. Right, that's and, true. And I think, you know, people with the recent video game films like a Detective Pikachu, like a Tomb Raider, there's been some hope. I think we are now getting over that hill of this the horrible video game movies. Gone are the days of the Mario Bros. Yeah. Just, just catastrophes. Woo. Um, and we have one now. It's Sonic the Hedgehog. And this had a crazy development. We're going to break it down. So for those new to Anatomy of a Movie, we're going to start out with just our overall thoughts of the film, then go back into some of the, the pre-production development of the film, then kind of break down the writing, the story, some of the performances, and now the box office, the success, and see if we think there might be a sequel. But Blobo, yeah. I just want to open up. Sure. Relation to the Sonic character. Did you play a lot of video games as a kid? Uh, yes and no. So we were a Nintendo household. Oh yeah. Uh, so so my, my mom's story goes. My mom, my brother was a nerd, thankfully. So his homework was done super quick. So my mom felt so bad for him sitting there twiddling his thumbs at 4:30 in the afternoon. Bought us a Nintendo. My next door <laughs> neighbor, the bad boy of the hood, had a Genesis. Oh so it was almost like forbidden fruit to go next door to play Sonic the Hedgehog. And sure, it was the first one. There was no tails. There was no. Spin dash, you had to go like like literally run as fast as you could. But yeah. I was instantly enamored. That was like what, 1991? I mean, wow. the, the, the don't thing date is, yourself. I gotta <laughs> do, I have to, bro. I mean, the thing about how this this character is so new, relatively speaking, in the, in the pantheon of Mickey Mouse and all these things, but it becomes such a an endearing icon to generations across all different nerddoms and fandoms. Dude, I was so excited to actually had a movie. And to your point, a lot of those video game movies could be scary. A lot of Sonic games were scary. Right. So I was kind of uh, I'm pleasantly surprised. Pleasantly surprised. Yeah. I mean, for me, the hope started after we got something like Wreck-It Ralph, where you had some of these characters in the background or as side yeah. characters. You're like, wow, this actually works in a narrative. For me, Sonic the Hedgehog, I am not a huge gamer. <clears> I usually, <throat> I know, but I did play a lot of video games as a kid. I'm just saying I wasn't really good at them. Yeah. Similarly, my neighbors had all the consoles. And yeah. we might have had an Xbox, but they had everything. So we would go over and just play with each other and play play the video game. Sonic the Hedgehog was on there. I was first introduced to him on one of the Super Smash Bros. games, and then I actually got one of the Sonic Which one? Uh, it was like the first one for Wii. Okay, like it so was like Brawl, yeah. Like Brawl, yeah. yeah. And uh, and I was like, oh my god, he's, he's awesome, he's fast. And then I actually got one of his games for PS2 and played it a lot. So I knew this character. I was familiar with a lot of the side characters. Uh, Dr. Robotnik right. that we see in this film. And I was really excited to see it come to life. And I just want to get your overall thoughts. What did you think? Did you see this movie yeah. on Valentine's Day? I did. Wow. I, my Valentine's Day was Sonic the Hedgehog. And we'll get into a lot of reasons why that is. But uh, as someone who was a, a fan from oh, oh, the first year, maybe even the second year of his existence as a character, uh, the fandom is one of the biggest fandoms on the planet. I, yeah. would, I would argue it's bigger than Harry Potter. I would argue it's bigger than Star Trek. And if you guys don't, really? if you don't believe me, I swear to you, go to Wikipedia. You'll notice there's like hundreds of thousands of documents and pages dedicated what? to the pantheon of Sonic the Hedgehog and the games and the characters and the Archie comics and all the books and stuff. The lore is, yeah. The, yeah. the lore had the most, and we think we've been to a lot. There have been some bad games. There have been some bad shows. There have been some corruption of what we think Sonic is and, and bad camera angles and all that. So this movie was really a culmination for that. It was like a thank you reward to the fans. And so we'll get into that more a little bit later when there was some fan service built in even before the movie was released. It was like finally someone's understanding the character and giving it just due. Totally. Yeah. And that's why we got you on the panel because I don't know a lot about the <laughs> history that. of Sonic. I didn't know he had all these pages in the Library of Congress <laughs> yeah, it's true. and all this. Yeah, you know, I, I was always a little apprehensive, like yeah. we said earlier. The video game movies just don't have a good track record. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even something like De Detective Pikachu, I actually enjoyed myself with. I thought it was a good 
time at the movies. It was, a, it was a fun film to watch. When you start to break it down in the story, like, yeah, it's not the most, doesn't make a lot of sense, but I actually thought it worked as opposed to stuff we've gotten in the past. Um, I kind of feel similarly about this movie. I yeah. think that this movie is a fun time at the theater. I was very satisfied, pleasantly surprised how much I enjoyed it. And above all else, Jim Carrey in this movie, oh my gosh, I just yeah. didn't expect to get this peak Jim Carrey performance that I don't think we've seen in a while. You know, he had such an incredible run in the 90s, early 2000s. And he has all these, you know, I don't need to tell you, he's just an incredible actor with so many rememberable uh, roles. One of this role, I think, is my favorite he's done in maybe 10 years. Yeah. I loved him in this movie, and he completely made the movie. And I think, as it, it's one thing to satisfy the kid audience. This is a PG film. It's more like a family-friendly movie. But I honestly think adults are going to enjoy this movie just as much as kids because of Jim Carrey and because of a lot of the jokes in this movie. So I did like it a lot, too. Um, do you think, as an overall film, yeah. that it, it kind of knocked it out of the park for you? Or were you just kind of like pleasantly, you were just satisfied with Th it? That's a fair question. I'm going to give it, if my, my review was at the time, that my knee jerk the day of right. uh, was was about 7. Maybe 6.75 out of 10. Out of 10. Okay. Um, it, the story was great. It was simple for the children, or the kids <laughs> out there, you know, kids at heart. Um, seeing things go fast is always great. But that really was the, the link to the older audience was Jim Carrey's performance. Because mm. now, as an adult, if you were like me and went by yourself, <laughs> you went with an actual child. <laughs> I went by myself on Valentine's Day, too. So we're both. Yeah, bam, why boom. not? <laughs> we should have gone together. I know, right? <laughs> uh, but but Jim Carrey's performances, you can sit there and say, hey, you know what? If you like him here, son, daughter, yeah. you know, here's a mask, here's Ace Ventura, right. here's these other movies where you had this kind of range. It was a treat for her. He that, really yeah. was huge, and people were kind of surprised how big he was. And I, I saw a few reviews saying, like, whoa, he's way too over the top. I'm like, do you even know Jim Carrey? Yeah. Like, he's over the top. You hired Jim Carrey to be over the top. Right. And I thought he just delivered. I don't want William Defoe as Dr. Robotnik. <laughs> <That's just not laughs> I kind of want to see that. But, <laughs> that dog. Yeah. but it's a great point. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it, looks, it sounds like we both really like the movie. I think once you start breaking it down a little, like, there's some... There's some story elements that I'm like, oh, that doesn't fully line up or that doesn't fully make sense. So they didn't really answer that, uh, that we'll kind of get into later with the writing, that that's where it starts to sort of fall apart for me. But mm -hmm. I still think this is a good film. I don't think it's anywhere near great, but I think okay. this is a solid good film. Um, let's just, we're just transitioning now into the development. Now, this movie had a really unique de production development history. Yeah. The first trailer coming out early 2018. With Coolio on the soundtrack. We own the soundtrack <laughs> and the reaction from the audience. Yeah. Oh my God. I don't think I've ever seen film Twitter just collectively agree this is terrible. Like everyone just thought Sonic looked awful. The animation, the visual effects. I know you know no offense to those artists, but like, man, this was bad. And I'm usually against audiences uh, changing something from the studio before they've seen it. Like before you've seen the final product, just having a predetermined uh, opinion on it. But this was bad, yeah. and I think this is an exception to that rule. And I'm really pleasantly surprised, uh, or I mean satisfied, that the fact that they actually changed it for the better. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's a very complex issue because even though the the, the design was was freakishly scary, yeah. uh, you can't deny that the, the hair effects and the the blades of the quills were definitely like top notch state of the art at the time. So like, yeah, Sonic shouldn't really have teeth or have split eyes like that. Right. But I, I really think what what made it awesome is that okay, I was so resigned in seeing Sonic fail in different media. Right, mm. it was kind of like okay, this is just an interpretation of Sonic. That's not for me. Like I, 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 I go to the store. I'm the guy who reads Archie comics. I buy the Archie comics at the at the newsstand or at the grocery store to read Avengers of, of Archie and Betty and Veronica. Right. But Riverdale isn't my flavor. I just figure <laughs> it's not for me. But then the fact that went back to see classic Sonic. I mean, even with the a little bit of a mix, it has like the classic Sonic. Uh, uh, head and the modern Sonic like body. I was like, great. Yeah, that the just, change. Yeah, it totally was. Hey, look, this is definitely for the people that, that that rode with us during the Sonic Adventure era. So this is like 99, 2000, 2001 uh, fan base as well. It rolls with that nostalgia really well, but man, that that other design is just horrifying. Like it really is bad. And I I do want to just say thank you so much to the studio for for really changing that and. And listening to the fans, do you think that this sets a false precedent, though, yeah. for the future moving forward? If fans take issue with something they see in a trailer yeah. or with concept art, like I know Batman set photos came out today, sure. and people are already like all up in arms. Some people love it, some people don't. Do you think this sets up a false precedent about 
audience having too much say with the studio and maybe changing their mind. Yeah, once you give audience a platform, they're always going to be in your ear. But if I'm Paramount and I'm a mini, I'm a major, but I'm not really a player like how Disney is. Everything's riding on not only this film but the franchise and the licensing of it. So yeah. as much as you want to say no, we're going to keep moving forward. We have the investment. If no one shows up to your movie, that franchise is dead in the water. Uh, now with movies being so risk averse and, and investing into intellectual properties, I'm sure they paid Sega a hefty fee for some. Sonic, yeah, you got to make sure that people show up, right? That's a great point. I think uh, the key difference with that parallel I was just drawing with Batman is Batman is a proven commodity at the box office. Yeah. Like it is box office, so you can really just trust your gut on your portrayal. Whereas Sonic, this is really the first feature film like we're getting in live action Sonic. They really got to make sure it's good this first time. So I, I agree with you. I, I, I'm worried. I'm always a little worried with if you give the audience an inch, they're going to take a mile. They always do. But I think this is an exception. Yeah. I really do. And I think it's working out handsomely for them. This has already made $128.3 million at the box office. Holy cow. Uh, yeah, rightfully like, so. That is wild. And I think that goes into what you were just saying earlier. Apparently there's like a massive fan group that I knew video game fans, there's a plethora, there's sure. a ton. But when it comes to Sonic the Hedgehog, like wow, I just didn't know that it was on par maybe even above Mario. Like, this yeah. is huge fandom, huge it, turnout. Yeah, and I, I think this, this because Sonic has been interpreted so many different times, there's people that have their own different flavors and the and the whole subculture about it. Uh, and if you're like me, the older fan group, because I am an old man, uh, a lot of us went because it was redesigned. Because mm. Hey, look, you took the effort to stop production. I think the director, Jeff Fowler, was his name Jeff Fowler? Yes. Uh, said, hey, look, man, we want to make this as best as we can. Bear with us. <laughs> that, to me, was, was enough to say, okay, they put the effort in, I'm going to go and show out and not to say I don't usually pay for movies but I'm at that age now where it's like I'll just wait six weeks because I grew up in a time where you'd wait six <laughs> months for video now you can wait six weeks so I was there day one day one and got the advance ticket because hey look I wanted to tell the studios that if you took the effortless to the fans mm. it'll pay off Wow. Yeah, I think it was a great move on them. It's definitely paying off now, and I think it's going to pay off moving forward. Uh, another big thing with just, you know, we love the movie, and we really had a good time, and I think the audiences are too. With a lot of these video game films, they're guaranteed, like, a massive amount of money. If you make a Mario movie, it's going to make X number of dollars. It's probably going to be successful. The thing is, if people like it, are they going to keep going back? Right. I think this is an example of one that people will keep going back for. Um, now kind of just moving into the movie, let's break this down a little. Let's, yeah. Let's get into the story, because I I was really surprised how endearing. I didn't know we were gonna get like a road trip Sonic movie. Yeah, yeah. that's basically what we got. But we're introduced to Sonic the Hedgehog up top, and he's he's hanging out. He, first of all, he has these rings, and we know that for those not familiar with the games or anything, these rings contain a lot of power, and they, he can kind of like jump in between worlds or teleport per right. se, wouldn't you? Yeah, it's kind of a, yeah, that's a reinterpretation because like the, the rings are the basic currency in the game uh, as far as like, getting rings and getting one ups. But there are warp zones where mm. at the end of levels, if you did pretty well, there was like a giant ring you can jump into for those bonus points and rounds. And, and stuff. he's hanging out on Earth. And yeah, you know, chilling out, chilling out. Well, props to him because he went to Earth as a kid. Like right. I moved to California at 21, and I was like struggling. <laughs> for years, you know what I'm saying? So He's basically Superman in that he's, he's gone from his world. Got his own place. Yeah. His own place, but he, but he, unlike Superman, he doesn't live among us, he hides. Right. And he's just kind of running by everyone at once. No one really sees him, and he's just hanging out in James Marsden, Officer Tom Wachowski, I yeah, believe? Yeah, Wachowski. Um, Officer Tom Wachowski's backyard, who Don't Lord. is just married, and he, he has dreams of moving to San Francisco and becoming more than just a beat cop. He wants to be a detective. He wants to be in the city, actually making a difference when maybe he's making a difference yeah. in his hometown. You know, at first, I was like, all right, where are they going to go with this? I actually really liked the first encounter. I thought that was so creative. Yeah. And that Jim Carrey's character, Dr. Robotnik, has been cleared by the government yeah. to just do anything. Begrudgingly. Begrudgingly. <laughs> yeah. Like he has, there's no rules. He yeah. can do whatever he wants. And I think the way they intro his character was beyond brilliant. Like yeah. he just comes in and he goes, what's your name? I don't care. Right. Stand out of my way. <laughs> What did you think of the introduction to all of these main characters? I think the Robotnik's introduction was one of the most like charming parts of the film. You, you can hear in the theater I watched and all of the adults just laugh because it was pure carry. It was definitely a good way to make this guy look sinister, uh, but not in a, in a real threatening way. Um, we're adults, but you know, as a kid, that first scene, seeing you know Sonic's caretaker 
assumingly being attacked. It was kind of <laughs> traumatic. Very, very Pixar formula. Like the, the, yeah. the, the top of the film, the murder, or whatever, whatever happens. Yeah, he's or, a yeah, so having the villain be like this fun loving guy was definitely like, a, hey, kids, we're not going to be that kind of movie. But the whole thing has a whole Spielbergian thing about it. Like E.T., like, you know, like this whole, like, we're the bad, we're the G Men. We're mm. going to get this alien thing. So I was on board for that. No. You, you know, they don't really ever go back to that, like where his caretaker, what happened to his caretaker, or those people that were after. Yeah. I'm assuming they might say that for a sequel. Did that bother you that we never got any more closure around that? Uh, it didn't bother me quite yet, but there's not much about Long Claw. So I, I really thought that would be some kind of reference at the end or a bookend or maybe she did it out. But like this as a setup to the premise of the movie. Here are your rings and here's what we can do with these rings. Peace. It was fine. Peace. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, so now Dr. Robotnik's after Sonic a great scene of him going up to, uh, or, or a great scene of him running into James Marsden and him shooting him with, what was the dart? Yeah, it was like a bear it was tranquilizer. A bear, <laughs> a bear tranquilizer yeah, yeah, that he joked about using over the phone with his wife, and then he shot Sonic with it, which was a great kind of plot device to slow Sonic down. Right. Like, he can't run after being tranquilized right. with that. What is pretty creative, right? My yeah. legs are like noodles or whatever he said. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So funny. Um, and then we get Robotnik going up to his house and basically saying, I think you have this this extraterrestrial, this other being yeah. on your property and him not letting him in. Um, we start to get that camaraderie with him and James Marsden's character and eventually them having to go on the road. Uh, what did you think about, you know, you have this character like Sonic who can literally run to the Pacific Ocean in three seconds yeah. and then come back. I was so fascinated by how they took that aspect of him and still had a story around it because you feel like, oh, he can probably solve a lot of problems really quickly, but he yeah. doesn't know any better. How do you think the writers did in, I guess, pandering or, not pandering, I guess, uh, uh, going to that level or just behaving with that. Yeah, plot for sure. I think pop culture has been spoiled with seven seasons of The Flash, right? You <laughs> wonder how many times did a guy run really fast, but they find ways to make that work. So, okay, he can't run because his legs are noodles, or he doesn't know where San Francisco is specifically. So, they, <laughs> yeah. there are very specific things put there in place to make sure, okay, it's not a, a five second film, right? Here's mm. it. And also, we'll get to it later, but like he couldn't run up the side of the building. He could run down, right. but he can't run up the side of the Trans America building to keep these other characters involved in the story. There were some rules. Yeah. They did set up a few rules in regards to Sonic. One thing I really loved was the slow motion sequences. Yes. We got something similar in a few X-Men movies with Quicksilver. True. Or even in The Flash. But this one was its own kind of thing. Like, it really, time froze for him, and right. he can do whatever he wants. I love the sequences. Did you have a favorite or one that stood out? Oh, well, definitely the one the Roadhouse, uh, the oh, bar. Yeah. Uh, this is the whole thing about the use of Z-axis motion. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, like, you know, things happen on planes, you know, vertical is Y, horizontal is X. That 3D front to camera and back to camera is called Z-axis motion. It shows dyna dynamicism in the scene, so things look faster. So here it is when time is slowing down. He's, like, going around and, like, you know, messing around around people with their, 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 their the cow cow heads and stuff on things at this roadhouse bar, which is very such a common movie trope of like, let's go to the bar and cause some havoc, cause some trouble, but it's done in such a, a cool and playful way. If I've never seen it before, if I was a kid, I'd be like, wow, this is pretty cool, pretty fun, pretty innovative. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. I, I, that roadhouse sequence was awesome. Yeah. It was kind of funny how they got in there, though, because Sonic just, like, looked out the window and saw people playing, and he's like, you know, I'm just going to go in. Yeah, it was kind of And kinda no random. one recognized him. <laughs> like, he has literally the most over-the-top disguise. I think he just had a cowboy hat on. Right. And some glasses. Hey, he has a disease, remember? That's <laughs> right. <laughs> that's that was, like, God. <laughs> okay. That yeah. was really funny. And now I, I actually want to bring up some of the comedic writing. I was shocked how much quote-unquote adult humor was kind of in this movie. Yeah. They even had, like, a domestic terrorism joke in there. Yes, exactly. They, they glorified, they said that Sonic was a domestic terrorist. Right. Did you think the humor would satisfy all audiences? Yeah, this reminds me of the time, like, in the in the mid-early 90s, the early 90s, where there wasn't a, a PG rating mm. or PG-13 rating. It was either, like, PG or R. Right. So all the films had this, like, this like weird middle way to, like, split, split the middle. So <laughs> movies like E.T., well, the, the, the penis breath joke, wouldn't happen oh, yeah. in a family film, but it does because it really wasn't a go. So I think that's what makes things rewatchable and almost like a tradition. I can imagine someone totally. saying, hey, look, every Valentine's Day we watch Sonic the Hedgehog because it's so unique for what it is. It really is. And I think there, there was another 
I don't know if this is much of a joke, and I might be jumping the gun a little t- towards the end, but when they go to that building, and they're like, we have a jumper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have a jumper on top of the building. Right. Let us go up. And they're like, all right, go for it. I was like, whoa, whoa yeah. that was in a Sonic movie? I thought you were saying that that's not my child in the bag. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Like, yeah. I was like, really Ooh. funny, though. Like, yeah. incredible sequences. I, I really thought that was entertaining. Um, just going along with the story now, I wanted to talk about back with Dr. Eggman or Robotnik, mm-hmm. just having no consequences to what he does to the earth. There was that sequence on the highway uh, when they're chasing after the truck. Right. He literally blows up a highway. Yeah. Well, it's Montana. Who it was Montana. <laughs> Who cares? No one cares. Yeah. Like, there was no one on the road. But wow, like there was a ton of destruction there <laughs> in a scene where they, they kept blowing up Dr. Robotnik's uh, car and then it would just split out like the Dark Knight's Batmobile. Right. Like that just a bike would come out or then a smaller one would come out. It just makes you wonder if like his stuff was all his stuff the government's okay with or was the government <laughs> yeah. sanctioned to like who's doing this like highway destruction program? I have no idea. Like, yeah, it almost like it, it didn't matter. Yeah, and, it you didn't know, matter at all. And when you start to really think about it, maybe it bothers you a little, but they the way they put it in the film it was just fun. Yeah, and even the, the small one when Sonic goes, can we keep him? Oh. Definitely a moment that goes back to a character beat. Because I think in most modern games, Sonic's about 15 years old. So there's that sense of wonder being like, oh, well, yeah, what, oh, what's really? this? Yeah, he's that. a teenager. Wow. He's a teenager, yeah. So they pull from a lot of different like lore. Like, you know, in, um, wow, let's stop being too nerdy here. You got it. There was two Sonic uh, cartoons that came at the same time. There's Go the off. one. There was Sonic the Hedgehog called Sad AM. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the one where he, like, you know, he has his own backstory about being an experiment for Robotnik. And then there's the Avenger of Sonic the Hedgehog, which is the one that Jaleel what, what, did first. White, I, uh, he did both, but he was boy, but he was that one first. And I watched the Avenger of Sonic the Hedgehog every morning before school. And to my knowledge, that go. was the one where they put the fact they love chi- chili dogs in his lore and everything and they call sen- back to that everything since then every movie or TV show since then has been like oh chili dogs and like yeah sure yeah. hedgehog eats chili dogs they had so many great easter eggs like that yeah. throughout the entire movie yeah. the things in the game I didn't even know that was a reference but they referenced chili dogs a all lot. the time yeah oh my gosh yeah it just really shows that they put a lot of love into this script which again we just haven't gotten that in a yeah. lot of video game movies or at least in the in the sense that they they relate to the story sure and I, I, yeah they just really knocked it out of the park with that um, do you like chili dogs? Are you a fan? I do like chili dogs. I never had one before. I, I've had chili. It's had weird because I used to love just plain old hot dogs, but now I've kind of, I don't know, they just kind of gross me out. Yeah, I'm great. Why. I'm the same way. Just kind of weird. Yeah. Anyway. I'm burger guy. Burger guy. Uh, just finishing up with the with the story <laughs> part of this. Man. Um, let's just get to, let's just fast forward to San Francisco. There's, okay. a, there's a lot of character beats along the way that I actually thought were really well handled. At one point, him just saying, you know, uh, like, this is in your space to Sonic, and Sonic... The whole plot of the movie, really, is Sonic just wants a friend. That's really the plot. He just wants to high-five a friend. Yeah. Which sounds like kind of a low stakes, but it works for this type of movie. True. And by the end, you know, we have this really fun finale uh, where they meet up with his wife and his sister-in-law. The sister-in-law character, I yeah. don't know about your theater, my theater loved her, thought she was hysterical. What did you think? You know what, taking a step back, I like the fact that the couple here was interracial, but it was never a plot point. It was never yeah. like, yo, my wife is this, and I'm this. So to have like almost a universal trope of the relative of a wife being like, I don't like him just for being that guy, being a bum, and not mm. because of his race, I thought it was pretty awesome. And, it, and I know it's a thing to, to, to jump on a soapbox about, yeah. but it's been about 15, 20 years to be seen that happen. So the fact that we have this this story about Sonic trying to find a family that loves him back the way he loves back that 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 town. Um, it was awesome that the only opposition he got or or his, his other family members got was in this weird big city they didn't want to be a part of to begin with because they belong in Montana. Completely, it, it was an interracial couple, and they didn't make any. Thing about it, it was just kind of a detail in the movie. Yeah. Um, I think they actually only kiss once, which yeah. I don't know if that was because it was a PG yeah. or anything like that. But uh, yeah, that, that was an interesting choice. The I just love the sister-in-law character so much because she just hates Tom. Yeah. The whole movie yeah. and is like, "Can you got divorced him?" She yeah. even spelled out divorce. Right. In that one scene. Oh, uh, she she was really great, and they tied her up. Well, I mean, it's a leak. <laughs> yeah. Like whoa. Very John Hughes of her, but <laughs> very John Hughes. <laughs> Uh, and then we get this sequence where they, they go up, there's a jumper, they're there, and they jump off the roof in a really cool use of that slow motion once again where he dodges all the bullets and rockets and jumps down, and he can run down the building, but yeah, not up. Yeah, right up the building. Um, and they teleport back home. 
which again, like just really clever storytelling. Yeah. And use of just like these two locations. Everything in San Francisco paid off. Like it just, mm. to me, it was kind of interesting where it was like, Maddie, oh, she's a veterinarian. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, maybe she can help you if you get injured. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or or the fact that Robotnik stole the quill, uh, one of Sonic's quills. So, like, when he was in the slow motion thing, it got, like, disrupted by having super fast Robotnik. And it was oh, like, my gosh. oh, no. Like, to me, everything, like, paid off at the end, which this takes me back to it, um, a review that Roger Eber had when he was alive about Punisher Warzone, <laughs> which is a random what reference. A, what a callback. Uh, and he says, look, man, there are no bad movies anymore because movie filmmaking has gotten so advanced and so evolved. Off. Here's a movie, Sonic the Hedgehog, where it could have just been like him running fast for two hours. I'm fine. <laughs> but now we have to these, watch. Yeah, we got these character beats and moments and story plot points to call back to each other and Chili Dogs. It's great. It was great. I mean, yeah, I think that's such an interesting Robert Ebert poll. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, there's a lot to unpack with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point. I, I definitely think it's these little details, it's this minutia that actually. I think makes this movie kind of stand above other video game films. And then, you know, the, it, it was similar to a scene right out of Man of Steel where they're just in this like small town, right on like the main road, and they're just having it out. And Dr. Robotnik's in the ship, right. aiming at Sonic, aiming at, aiming at Tom. And Jim Carrey is just huge at this yeah. point. And he, they get the rings and send him off to this like random world. Yeah. Uh, really a fun finale. A mushrooms, that's right. <laughs> the mushroom planet. Yeah. I thought it was a really fun finale, and yeah. it didn't really drop the ball. It stayed the course. How did you think they wrapped up the film? It's classic Sonic. The first couple uh, zones in the first game, all you do is jump on his ship. And what, we saw that, right? And we saw it in a way, Grant is kind of like the the the... The, I don't want to say cheesy, but the trope of everyone coming out, like old West, high noon going, what's going on? We're not going to do anything. We're going to stand here. But to me, it was great. It, it totally played to it. And again, it paid off the fact that uh, when Sonic gets uh, emotionally charged, he literally charges up. Right. And so that's why his his extra oomph, uh, you know, destroyed that ship, or at least pushed the ship into the mushroom planet. I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, so we, we covered the story. I just want to go over a few of my favorite scenes real quick. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Dr. Robotnik getting the quill. Mm -hmm. The scene in his vehicle, yeah, where he puts the quill in and just starts dancing, right, is going to be a huge meme. First off, yeah. when this movie comes out, everyone's going to rip that and add any song they want to it. Oh my gosh, this was my highlight moment for Carrie. Yeah, where you could tell this was just like pure improvisation. There's no way they wrote this. Right. They probably wrote like he dances a little. Yeah, exactly. He, this was like a minute and a half. And one of my favorite lines is when his assistant come, comes up to him and is like, I just want to see if you want a latte. And he yells, of course I want a latte. I love the way you make them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. That's a line of the show right there. I think he, I'll hope they do it nuts. He was just, that was my highlight of the film. Did you have like a highlight moment or scene? Favorite part. I, I love the latte line. I can't, I can deny that. Because yeah. it was like totally in the minute. And I like the fact that he's like making things happen in his lab. Um, even though it kind of ended weird for me because it had to move the plot along, I did like the baseball scene. I'm a baseball guy. Uh, I love the fact he played every single position and he was like sitting there going like hating himself, but loving himself. And after a while, they didn't even show him moving to each position. He was just playing himself. Which I thought was pretty cool. And that's it, a great scene. And if I can go that fast, I'll probably do it all day. You know? it, it showed us up top just how fast he is. Like he can do all this at once. Yeah. So th that was a great scene because also just showed us more about his character. Um, you know, moving on from that, just talking about the cast real quick. You know, you said Jaleel White, he, he voiced Sonic in a lot of the TV shows and games. Ben Schwartz voicing Sonic in this one. Ben Schwartz from Parks and Rec fame. And I think the Good Morning Show on YouTube, a good oh, comedy yeah. show. Yeah. yeah. He's really funny. I thought he was solid as Sonic, and I, I was surprised his voice could actually get that high. I sure. couldn't even picture Ben Schwartz when I was watching this movie. Yeah. Um, what did you think of the cast? Did you have any standouts? Ah, oh, man, that that's really hard. Um, because again, I've I've grew up with Jaleel White. You know, that's no good. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, uh, for the video games, Roger Craig Smith is my favorite of all time. He actually went to my, my film school, he was a Chapman. Oh, wow. Uh, and J Jason Griffith had a, because he's also in the Sonic X anime and some of the, the recent games. So if you played Adventure, Sonic Adventure 2 through Heroes, Jason Griffith was your guy. So did, did you miss any of them? Did you did you wish that either of them were kind of the voice? Roger Craig Smith is my guy. Like, it's, it's almost like, uh, what, what's his name? Uh, when you talk about Batman. You know, uh, you know, Conroy, Kevin Conroy, yeah, Kevin Conroy. He's, he's Batman. And sure, Bruce Greenwood's good, and but like, you know, Kevin Conroy's Batman. So me, Roger Craig Smith will always be Sonic. 
but Blue it was that's my Batman. <laughs> yeah, Lego Batman. Uh, it was great. I mean, I think he acquitted himself well to, to have that younger character and then be full of wonder, but not be able to, to fight back and say, hey, look, you're leaving your family by going to San Francisco. You need a little bit of that gravitas, too. Totally. Uh, and, I, you know, a lot of the human characters, I had no problems with any of their performances. I thought they were all fine, um, kind of surface level, but not bad by any means. Aside from Jim Carrey, he was terrific. Uh, just going to the, there were, we had a few post credits. Okay, yeah. There was a post credit scene in this movie, and There's a couple. <laughs> Tails. Yes. Tails. Woo. At the end of this movie. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. Probably gonna be in the sequel. Hopefully I'm excited. Zoom. We had again, we had a writer come on one of our uh, sister shows on this network called The Con Guys. Um, it was Josh w Josh Miller. Josh Miller, one of the five writers on this, but he's one of the two credited with the actual official screenplay. He said he would love to get Knuckles in the sequel. Is there any major character or detail that you would want in a Sonic the Hedgehog sequel? Man, uh, a lot of my favorite characters are so obscure it probably wouldn't even make sense there. But uh, Shadow eventually, uh, even though Shadow got really corny towards the end of his, his run, but the idea of like another of being a genetically engineered hedgehog life form would be a kind of cool idea as a as a movie trope. Um, in the Sonic Riders Shadow, series, yeah. yeah, he's so cool. I'm a Jet the Hawk fan, even though it's kind of <laughs> random. <laughs> yeah. And then if you're going to be old school Genesis, you got to put like Mighty or the Armadillo in there. That was my three choices right oh there. My, did, so, did any of those final scenes kind of like excite you for the sequel? We had Eggman. Shaved head, yeah, big stash, yeah, like oh my god, yeah, just going huge. But that was always my question as a kid. I was like, because you know, the idea is that Eggman is taking all these furry woodland creatures and putting them in the machines. So you're like, well, who's this one dude in Green Hill Zone who's hanging out? <laughs> <laughs> like, where's his friends and family? Like, where does he get his groceries? So now I see why he was an Earthling that got moving on. Yeah, uh, Bibito in the uh, chat says he wants Big the Cat and Froggy uh, from Sonic <laughs> Adventure One in oh the my series. Gosh. Yeah, they're, they're, it just feels like they can go anywhere. With yeah. That. It had such a open. It had a great ending, but it left the door open for so many possibilities, and it felt pretty natural. Um, just talking about other details of the film. I, this is a. I'm more critical now. Just a little yeah. issues we had um, moving into that side of things. The product placement in this movie. There is one scene that I think was so appallingly product placement. I haven't felt so like forced to endure it since something like Transformers 4 with the Bud Light. Okay. There's a scene in this movie where they literally go, I have no apps on my phone. Oh my God, I, I, it's, it's clean. Other than the Olive Garden app, man, bottomless <laughs> breadsticks. That bowl is amazing. You're like, what? What's wrong with Olive Garden? Dude, that was so in your face. Okay. You oh know my what? God, that bothered me so much. And then later in the movie, they do yeah. it again. Yeah. They're like, oh my God, uh, you have the Olive Garden app? Yeah. Oh, their bottomless breadstick bowl is great. Like what? You, you are probably right. Olive Garden got paid a massive sum. But I will say this. When I was 18, I went away to college to a small town in Florida and Olive Garden and Chili's were like things to do every weekend. We're going to Olive Garden. Woo! No, sh no shots at Olive Garden. Yeah, and I don't shots. think they got paid. I think, I think they paid for, so I think they paid for Sonic for this product placement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I am just, wow. They couldn't have been any more subtle. And it wasn't quite playful enough for me to yeah, be like, oh, they're fair. joking around. I, I, I was just rolling my eyes. And I forgot about it because it, it was a brief. It wasn't like as obscene or as long as like a Bud Light scene in a Transformer. That movie. reminds me of Iron Man 1 with the Burger King. Like, wait, <laughs> all the weeks out there in the Middle East, you want a cheeseburger, a Wawa? But listen, dude, Are you that, me? they kind of made that. You know what? I'll fight you on that one because that one <laughs> me. that one felt like it played into the in the story. Like he'd just been in this cave all. He wants an American cheeseburger. Yeah. They, they didn't say Burger King. It was kind of in the corner. It wasn't taking up the whole frame. They literally were like the Olive Garden app. Bottomless <laughs> breadsticks. That endless salad. How great is it? I'm like, jeez. It was aggressive. Let's go afterwards, man. I'm hungry. Let's go. Yeah. We'll, we'll get a reservation and everything. App, the Olive Garden app. Now available now. But for a movie, you know, for that to be my biggest, my biggest critique, that's... That's fine, yeah. I think. Uh, other than that, a few story things, like Dr. Eggman's Invincible. He, there's basically no... This is one thing I thought of. Sure. They, they Again, they classify Sonic, the government, the <laughs> our U.S. government classified USA. Sonic as a domestic terrorist. I didn't see them remove that, that label. Right. So, as far as we know, he's still a terrorist. That sounds like a John Wick story. <laughs> you must Great. have run, John. You have 48 hours. I, I, it's funny that you mentioned that, because imagine if, if 
if you look at Sonic Adventure 2, the first uh, uh, mission is when you, you know, City Escape, when he jumps out of the little helicopter and it's like G-U-N going after him. Like, I want to see that. I want to see, like, guns and lasers from other government organizations, you know, running, chasing Sonic. At least at first, <laughs> until we realize it's a bigger threat. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I guess. I guess I can suspend my disbelief for that. I was still... I don't know. I still wanted a little bit of that closure because they they made a point to classify him as a domestic terrorist, and yeah. then they never removed that. Or they didn't really see. I don't think the world got to see Sonic be the hero, even though he did save the day. Yeah. So it might be like a superhero situation where he's still going to be in hiding. True. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. The government does come to their doorstep at the end, and they're like, "Yeah, oh, he's not here," and they're like, "We know he's here. Yeah, we'll be after him." Right. Which was kind of nice. And um, who's Arthur Robotnik? Right. Where is he? <laughs> He's been disavowed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, a lot of fun stuff with that. Let's see. I'm just going to break down some of the audience reception now. Uh, positive all the way around. Tomato meter at 63%. People sometimes think that's bad. That is a fresh rating. Um, that is the majority of the critics. 63% of the critics that saw this liked the movie. They yeah. had a positive rating. IMDb score of a 6.9. The cinema score of an A, which is, wow, that, that's pretty high. Yeah. Um, so a glorified, positive, reviewed film. And that all across the board. Really great to hear. And the box office, as we said earlier, $128.3 million so far. Million? Holy cow. Yeah. I think it's only going to grow. They don't have another animated, for per se, release until Onward with Pixar. And this isn't really an animated movie. This is a live-action Sonic. But I think that is the same audience. I, I just think that this is a full-blown success. And I could not be more excited to see where they move forward with it. Any comments on the audience reception or how that might move the box office forward? Yeah, it was one of those things where you kind of were wishing, hoping that people come out and like it. Because even though there was rumblings of, oh, let's go and support the film because of the, the reanimation. Let's go and support the film because of Valentine's Day and we're all single. Do you think Valentine's <laughs> Day was a, a big aspect a of huge, it? Huge, man. Because yeah. if you look at that, that that weekend, there's not much to watch if you did not have a significant other. It's a good point. It's escapism in the, in the most places of the country. It's the middle of winter. Yeah. So it's the middle of winter, you're getting a, a giant summer movie formula in February. I don't see why that, that did not play into Plus, it. Plus, President's Day. That, that Monday. Yeah. So you have a two-holiday knock, boom, boom. All the people who are kind of single, or even with your couples, they go to see this movie, and it's a family-friendly movie, and you also have that third day off. Yeah. I think this was just a great spot. I know Deadpool did this in years past. They opened True. on Valentine's Day. This has become like a big weekend at the movies to really open your film. Absolutely, because everyone wants to be out, whether or not they have someone or not. You don't want to be stuck at home with a bottle of wine. That's your thing, you know? And, yeah, entirely. Yeah. And I, I think it's just another reason, because, again, it, you can watch Netflix any night. Streaming's a thing. You can watch your shows at home. But when it's a long weekend like that, you want to get out of the house. You want to do something. Like you said, it's winter. You probably don't want to do something too much outside. You're going to go to the movies. Yeah. This is the perfect thing to release on a weekend. And like I kind of, I'm not sure if it's like a shifting movie thing or an age thing. There's very few movies now when you when it ends and then the lights go on and curtains up, you feel like that. Like like a day when you saw a James Bond movie, you want to like you become a spy. You saw Iron Man, you want to be super strong. Uh, yeah, I ran to my car. Uh, right down the, uh, the the mall. Everyone was like, who's that guy? But I was like, I've got to go fast. <laughs> You know? it, 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 yeah, it inspired me to run, too, the yeah, next day. Exactly. I, was, I just want to be like Sonic. Yeah. Well, we're winding down here, Flobo. Yeah. Any final thoughts on Sonic the Hedgehog? Final thoughts. Yeah, I the movie itself uh, isn't perfect, but definitely sets the groundwork for a much larger universe, and world building is amazing. Uh, I am so glad that I, there's something in the modern era that older fans can bring younger fans to and share about. And so that's what really what culture is about. Because even though a, a franchise may be new, like a Harry Potter or like a Deadpool or like a Harley Quinn, if they have enough of a fan base and supporting it, it could live forever. And this could be the start of a whole new renaissance to the Blue Bird. Do you think it could be a whole new franchise as well? Yes. Yeah. Point blank, yes. And it's, it's how I felt about Detective Pikachu. It's it's a fun video game film. It has a, a great narrative. It has a good narrative. It, it's far from great. It's yeah. a good narrative. And I think it just opens the door for more fun times at the movies. Like this is this is a fun time. If you're a fan of Sonic, you're gonna be a fan of this movie. I cannot see this disappointing any Sonic fans out there. So I think go see it if you haven't already. Go see it again. Take some friends. It's a, it's a it's a really fun time. But we are wrapping up here, Flobo. Please yeah. comment below, subscribe, hit that like button, and give us an iTunes review on iTunes Anatomy of a Movie. 
Flobito. Yeah. Where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Flobo Boys, on Instagram at Flobito, Flobito.com, and over at After Buzz TV <laughs> Wrestling and Sports, the Monday Night Raw After Show and the WWE NXT After Show. I'm there. Come say hi. You can find me at Ryan Nilsson, R-Y-N-I-L-S-E-N on Twitter, at Ryan Nilsson on Instagram, and every Thursday, 4 p.m. Pacific Time, Star Wars News Weekly with Steph Sabra. Thank you so much for watching that Even Movie. Until next time. And Our founder, Kevin Undergaro, and me, Maria Menunos, would like to thank you for tuning in to AfterBuzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first, we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to AfterBuzzTV.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. <laughs> The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.